Ever wondered why this skeptic suffered from high blood pressure? Because he took everything with a grain of salt. <laughs> and what do you call it when you hit someone on the head with a salt shaker? You call it assault. <laughs> Hi everybody, it's Ryan here. Hope you and your family are well. Today we are tackling a very, very common problem in medicine, something which is increasing in prevalence worldwide. We're talking about essential hypertension. This is the breakdown of our talk. We're going to be tackling a clinical case and breaking down hypertension in terms of our six main headings, right? This is the theme for most of the videos on this channel. We're going to be breaking down the topic of hypertension in terms of etiology and classification, pathophysiology, patient presentation, which includes signs and symptoms, differential diagnosis, diagnostic evaluation, treatment and management, prognosis and complications. Then, we, of course, we're going to encourage some scripture. Now, the topic of hypertension is quite broad, quite vast. So we're going to be covering topics of hypertensive urgency and emergency and our approach to those, and secondary hypertension in another video. Here, we're just focusing on essential hypertension. All right, guys, so this is our handy clinical case. So we have, we are actually asking the question today. We state that a large proportion of blood pressure is determined by peripheral vascular resistance. Now, which of the following anatomical vascular structures contributes most to systemic peripheral vascular resistance? Is it A, the capillaries, B, the large arteries, the posterior child for daddy's the aorta? Is it the large veins, the small arteries and arterioles, or is it the venules? Hmm, nice to ask. Okay, everybody. So we know that uh, hypertension affects more than 1 billion people worldwide. That is crazy. Right, it is one of the most important and modifiable risk factors for chronic kidney disease, stroke, and coronary artery disease. The prevalence in most populations is known to increase with age, and some 90 to 95 percent of cases are idiopathic, which is what we term essential hypertension, which is what we're going to be addressing in today's video. The remainder of cases occur secondary to an underlying disorder, and that is what we term secondary hypertension, which we will be covering in a subsequent video. Now, most patients require combination therapy to optimize blood pressure control. We, we will be talking about that under treatment. So in terms of etiology, we know, everybody, that blood pressure reflects cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance, and cardiac output is uh, constituted by heart rate and stroke volume. So hypertension, by and large, is due to an imbalance between vasopressor and vasodilatory systems. It is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, and it's the second most common cause of institutional disease, number one, of course, going to diabetes mellitus. Now, renal disease can be a cause or a consequence of hypertension. You know the story of the chicken and the egg, which came first? Did the chicken come first or the egg come first? So the, is the hypertension causing the chronic kidney disease or is the chronic kidney disease driving the hypertension? Hmm. Essential hypertension is twice as common among people who have uh, parents who also have hypertension. Okay, so this is what we spoke about in terms of the path of fizz. So we know that arterial pressure, right? is the product of cardiac output and peripheral vascular resistance. Cardiac output is further uh, composed by stroke volume and heart rate and peripheral resistance by vascular structure and vascular function. But the main players in the game here that contribute to vascular resistance are our arterioles, our high resistance vessels, right? This is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which underpins a lot of the blood pressure that we have. Okay, so, you know, angiotensinogen is produced by the liver, and uh, renin is produced by the just glomerular apparatus in the kidneys. So, the claim to fame of renin is that it converts angiotensinogen, the inactive form, to angiotensin 1. And then we have angiotensin-converting enzyme, otherwise called ACE kinase 2. And um, angiotensin converting enzyme converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, right? And angiotensin 2 then acts on the angiotensin 1 receptor, right? And that produces aldosterone, but it also acts on the angiotensin 2 receptor, causing efferent arteriolar vasoconstriction. Alrighty? ACE kinase is also, even though it plays a role in uh, conversion of ACE1 to ACE2, it also converts bradykinin to inactive peptides. Now, you notice that some patients who are on ACE inhibitors also have a problem with angioedema, and some patients often have this dry, persistent cough, right? And that is because your ACE inhibitor inhibits this enzyme, right? And as a result, you may have accumulation of branichinin products uh, here, of branichinin, which causes that dry cough. Okay, risk factors for hypertension, everybody. 
So uh, certain populations have been known to be associated with hypertension, uh, notably black and Hispanic ethnicity, obesity, excessive alcohol intake, low socioeconomic status, low dietary potassium, high sodium intake, and women also have greater risk for hypertension post-menopause. Secondary hypertension, just want to mention a little bit, but this will be the topic of another video. This accounts for the other approximately 5 to 10% of cases that are not accounted for by essential hypertension. And we break it down system-wise. So renal causes of secondary hypertension includes renal vascular hypertension, renal parenchymal hypertension, renal artery stenosis, which is part of renal vascular, and ADPKD, adult polycystic kidney disease, which is part of uh, renal parenchymal hypertension, endocrine disease in the way of... Uh, Hypoaldosteronism, Cushing syndrome, which are the and 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 uh, phaeochromocytoma, which are the adrenal causes. Hyperparathyroidism, hypo and hyperthyroidism, hyperreninism as well. Cardiopulmonary disease in the way of coarctation of the aorta and obstructive sleep apnea. Inherited disorders in the way of Little syndrome, the syndrome of inappropriate ADM. Um, I beg your pardon, the syndrome of apparent mineralocorticoid excess, the same one. <laughs> glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism and congenital adrenal hyperplasia, drugs, 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 and more drugs, non steroidals glucocorticoids, all of contraceptive pills, licorice, the list goes on, right? Now, how do patients with hypertension present? Now, hypertension has been dubbed the silent killer because most cases are actually asymptomatic. Elevated blood pressure is often just an incidental clinical finding when you're examining the patient. Isolated headaches may correlate with elevated blood pressure, and that's what some patients complain of. In cases of hypertensive crisis or long-term uncontrolled hypertension, you may manifest with target organ damage. Now, in terms of target organ damage, you think brain, eyes, heart, kidneys. Brain, eyes, heart, kidneys. So in the eyes, we have retinopathy. Patient will complain of visual changes. You may have bilateral papilledema, exudates. But if you look on phonoscopy, there's four grades called the Keith Wagner changes of hypertensive retinopathy with grade one being silver wiring, grade two is arterial venous nipping, grade three is flame-shaped hemorrhages and cotton wool spots, and four is when you have the above plus papilledema. All righty. Uh, other forms of target organ damage, hypertensive encephalopathy, patient complains of headache, nausea and vomiting, we have mental status changes, you may have seizures and neurological deficits. Of course, we have kidney uh, injury, so in the way of renal failure, cardiac ischemia, congestive heart failure, all those are target organ damage. Alrighty. So what's the differential diagnosis for essential hypertension? Well, it could be dealing with an improper measurement, and we'll talk about the, the proper way to take a blood pressure. could be white coat hypertension. Uh, where the patient's blood pressure is increased only when in a health establishment with a healthcare professional, but at other times at home the blood pressure is normal. <clears throat> the phenomenon of pseudohypertension in which there's severe atherosclerotic vascular disease which renders the vessel incompressible. <clears throat> Elevated blood pressure associated with pain, stress, exercise, emotion. Then there's volume overload in which there's excessive sodium intake, inadequate dietary therapy, uh, fluid retention due to kidney disease, excessive alcohol intake, and drug-induced as well. Patients who take lots of non steroidals because, you know, non steroidals <clears throat> are not good because not only they do, do they induce fluid retention, but they also inhibit your prostaglandins. And prostaglandins, we know the claim to fame of prostaglandins is that they maintain afferent arteriolar vasodilatation. They are absolutely critical when it comes to maintaining your GFR. You give non steroidals you inhibit the prostaglandins, you cause constriction of the afferent arterial, diminishing your GFR. Right, uh, pe pe people who also use substances like cocaine, steroids, and pathomimetics that may induce high blood pressure. So guys, how do we evaluate someone with high blood pressure? So the diagnosis of hypertension requires two or more blood pressure readings taken at different visits with the patient seated comfortably for at least five to 10 minutes before you take that blood pressure. Ideally, the arm should be supported at the level of the heart and the blood pressure cuff of proper size should be used, which should encircle about 80% of the arm. Now, ambulatory blood pressure measurements may be useful if office readings are inconsistent or if you suspect white coat hypertension, right? So this is uh, taken from Harrison's, as we know, the blood pressure classification in adults. Right, so as we know, let's get my pointer in there. So normal blood pressure is systolic below 120 and diastolic below 80 most mercury. Elevated blood pressure, but not yet hypertension, means a systolic of between 120 to 129 and a diastolic still below 180, uh, below 80, I beg your pardon. So in hypertension, we stratify it into stage 1, stage 2. Stage, stage 1 is where your systolic blood pressure is between 130 and 139, and notice this becomes O. 
the diastolic is between 80 and 89. Stage 2 hypertension is uh, where your systolic blood pressure is above 140 or your diastolic is above 90. That's as per Harrison's. Okay, so uh, examples of systolic hypertension with a wide pulse pressure etiologies. It could be diminished vascular compliance as with arteriosclerosis, or it could be increased cardiac output, so aortic regurgitation, diatoxicosis, hyperkinetic heart syndrome, fever, AV fistula, PDA, all your causes of a, um, a high output state, essentially. So in terms of diagnostic evaluation for patients with high blood pressure, history and exam should assess for etiologies like uh, is the patient on medications which can induce high blood pressure, sympathomimetics, is the patient using any illicit drugs that we spoke about, inquire about sodium and potassium intake and a family history, <clears throat> what about symptoms or signs of secondary uh, causes of hypertension and any symptoms of target organ damage. Important aspects of the physical exam include measurements of blood pressure on both arms and legs if clinically indicated, if you are thinking of something like coarctation for instance. For endoscopy to look for the changes of retinopathy, a cardiac exam watch out for the infamous fourth heart sound which speaks to diminished ventricular compliance right, because of chronically increased afterload and ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, uh, so you've got a stiff non-compliant ventricle. Then abdominal exam and listen for debris for renal artery stenosis or if there's masses which may speak to polycystic kidneys, skin exam, rash and vasculitis. So this is what Harrison tells us, relevant history and physical exam in a patient who has hypertension. So history, look at the duration of hypertension, uh, previous therapies and did they work and any side effects. Family history of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, very important. Dietary and psychosocial history, alcohol consumption, look at the other risk factors like weight change, dyslipidemia, smoking, diabetes, physical inactivity. The evidence of secondary hypertension, and the way of history of renal disease or change in appearance and urine color, clarity, uh, muscle weakness, spells of sweating, palpitations or tremor, which may point to hypothyroidism, may point to phacromocytoma, erratic sleep and snoring and daytime somnolence, which points to obstructive sleep apnea, symptoms of hypo and hyperthyroidism, right? So they talk about heat intolerance or cold intolerance, appetite and weight change, change in the skin, hair or voice, change in the menses, right? Uh, use of agents that may increase blood pressure. Also ask about evidence of target organ damage, like did you have a TIA, a transient ischemic attack before? Did you have a stroke before? Uh, transient blindness, angina, myocardial infarct, congestive heart failure, sexual function, other comorbidities. Physical exam, you know, we covered some of this in the previous slide. We're looking at uh, body habitus, right? Do they have a metabolic body habitus? Right? Do they have any astigmata of endocrine disease like acromegaly or hypothyroidism or uh, Cushing's for instance, blood pressure in both arms, supine and standing blood pressures, otherwise you're going to miss postural hypotension, right, which is a common side effect of antihypertensives. For endoscopic examination of the retina, we said the four Keith Wagner changes in the uh, of hypertensive retinopathy, quality of the femoral and pedal parcels, thinking about coarctation, vascular and abdominal bruise, thinking about renal artery stenosis, cardiac rate and rhythm, signs of congestive heart failure, and characteristics of secondary hypertension. Nice one. Initial lab testing in a patient with hypertension includes urinalysis. You want to check the proteinuria, right? Especially in the setting of CKD or early CKD. Put to do a urine protein creatinine ratio as well. Serum chemistries, evaluate for proteinuria. You can do this with either a formal 24 hour testing or a urine protein creatinine ratio. A calcium lipid panel ECG looking for left ventricular hypertrophy with strain or changes of ischemia. Okay, so you want to obviously advise the patient, listen, you need some lifestyle changes, smoking cessation, weight loss, dietary changes, right? Sodium restriction to less than 2 grams per day is critical. Potassium supplementation, right? Because you say, you know, how the proverbial thing is, that, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but now the apple has now become the banana. Uh, banana! Um, because potassium supplementation is important uh, to reduce your blood pressure. Exercise and patients should be counseled to lower salt and increase potassium and calcium in the diet. Now, of course, this doesn't hold true if you have uh, target organ damage in the way of nephropathy because in CKD, you don't really want to take in too much potassium because you can't excrete that and that will predispose to arrhythmias. Okay? So this is Harrison's once more uh, <clears throat> looking at our basic lab test for initial evaluation. Right, so here we said renal, you want to do check for microscopic urinalysis, albumin excretion, serum urea creatinine, compute your GFR, endocrine, you want to do your uh, serum sodium, potassium, calcium, TSH, metabolic panel, fasting blood glucose, total cholesterol, especially HDL, LDL, 
uh, cholesterol, triglycerides, other tests is FBC and ECG. If they were looking for left ventricular hypertrophy with strain, we're looking for ischemic changes on that ECG. Right, let's talk medications, guys. Medications are often necessary to lower the blood pressure to below 140-90, often the target, or below 130-80 in the setting of diabetes or CKD. Many patients would require more than one medication. So a thiazide is gently indicated as the initial antihypertensive therapy of choice. Watch out for hyponatremia, right? ACE inhibition should be used, uh, and compelling indications for an ACE inhibitor are patients with congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and vascular disease. Compelling indications for a beta blockade would be in patients with coronary artery disease, recent myocardial infarct, congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation for rate control, patients with migraine headaches, hyperthyroidism, and acute aneurysm uh, or dissection. ACE inhibitors and ARBs and ALDO antagonists may benefit stable heart failure. We know it's one of those drugs which portend a mortality benefit in stable heart failure. The other two, of course, being beta blocker and uh, spinal actor, right, which is an example of an ALDO antagonist. Beta blockers, ACE inhibition, and ALDO antagonists in post-MI patients, right? In diabetic patients with microalbuminuria, this is very important. In diabetic patients with microalbuminuria, ACE inhibition for type 1 diabetics and angiotensin receptor blockers for type 2 diabetics are recommended. Uh, but you can also use ACE inhibitors in type 2s as well. In diabetic patients without, without microalbuminuria, these agents may delay or prevent progression to the development of uh, proteinuria. All right. Thiazides and ACE inhibitors are recommended for recurrent stroke prevention. The preferred drugs in pregnancy, remember that, that ACE inhibition and um, ARBs actually are teratogenic, so we don't want to use that in pregnancy. What we do use in pregnancy for hypertension, especially with preeclampsia or even gestational hypertension, is methyl dopa, beta blockers, vasodilators, alrighty? Self-monitoring of blood pressure at home may be recommended. So these are the lifestyle modifications to manage your hypertension, all right? So you're going to counsel the patient to reduce their weight, ideally attain and maintain a BMI below 25 grams per square meter, dietary salt reduction to less than 6 grams of sodium chloride per day, adapt a DASH-type dietary plan. So you want to have a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, low-fat dairy products, which reduce content of saturated total fat. Diet is also rich in potassium, right? We said that bananas are the new apples. Calcium and magnesium, right? Moderation of alcohol consumption for those who drink alcohol, consume less than two drinks per day if you're a male, less than two drinks per day if you're a female. Physical activity, regular aerobic activity, advise brisk walking for about 30 minutes per day. These are common side effects, guys, with various classes of antihypertensive drugs. So, ACE inhibitors, we know, we spoke about the pathophors of this as to why they get the dry cough, right? So, cough, hyperkalemia, ARBs can, is much less frequent hyperkalemia in comparison with their ACE brothers. In terms of calcium channel blockade, we've got the dihydropyridine flavor, which is, of course, nifedipine, amlodipine, can cause pedal edema and headache. But non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, verapamil, diltiazem, can cause, well, verapamil is known for constipation, diltiazem for headache, headache, and more headache. Diuretics, as you know, like Lasix and thiazides, right, they can cause frequent urination, hyperglycemia. So advise the patient not to take this at night because this can be running to the loo all the time. Hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, hyperuricemia. Thiazides are linked with hyperuricemia, sexual dysfunction. Central alpha agonists can cause sedation, dry mouth, rebound, hypertension, sexual dysfunction. Alpha blockers like uh, doxazosin, prazosin can cause pedal edema, orthostatic hypotension, dizziness. Beta blockers can cause fatigue, bronchospasm. So watch beta blockers in the setting of patients with asthma. Hyperglycemia, sexual dysfunction. Potassium channel. Uh, openers can cause hypertrichosis, that's in the way of monoxidal. Lupus-like reactions where antihistone antibodies can be positive with non-specific joint and skin changes. Pedal edema, uh, that's in the setting of hydrolysis. And remember, thiazides can also cause hyponatremia. Okay, so this is basically what we've discussed in pictorial representation as per the JNC-8 guidelines. So we said here the initial drugs of choice for hypertension uh, let's just get my pen in there. When well, ACE inhibitor, angiotensin receptor blocker, thiazide, or a calcium channel blocker. Right, and there's three strategies we can adopt. Strategy A is where you start one drug and titrate to maximum dose and then add a second drug. This is not a very popular strategy. St strategy B is where you start one drug, add a second drug before achieving max dose of the first. This by far is probably the most common strategy. Or if the patient has severe hypertension on presentation, begin two drugs at the same time as separate pills or combination pills. Initial combination therapy is recommended if the blood pressure is greater than 20 over 10 was mercury above goal. Got you. Then, of course, lifestyle changes we've already covered. This is just to summarize. Smoking cessation, control of uh, better glycemic control, 
control your lipids, diet, eat healthy like a DASH diet, moderate alcohol consumption, reduce sodium intake, and then physical activity. We spoke about this, right? So if you have a patient with hypertension who is above 18 years of age, intermittent lifestyle mods, as we discussed here, set your blood pressure goal based on the algorithm. So the algorithm has two branch points. On the left-hand side, general population who does not have diabetes or CKD with hypertension. On the right-hand side, diabetes or CKD with hypertension. And both of these groups have hypertension. On the left, so if your patient has no diabetes or CKD and is above 60 years of age, your blood pressure goal is below 150-90. But if the patient... Uh, is less than 60 years old without diabetes or CKD, our goal is less than 140-90. Then we further satisfy it in terms of whether the patient is black or, or, or not, right? Because we know that certain populations just want better to thiazides, right? Uh, if your patient has diabetes or CKD, uh, at all ages diabetes is present but no CKD yet, your blood pressure goal is less than 140-90. But if you have hypertension uh, right, and all ages and races where CKD is present with or without diabetes, same BP goal below 140-90. But some uh, recommend a blood pressure goal, which is kind of more strict below 130-82, the top progression of CKD. Right? But ideally, if you have um, CKD or diabetes, you want to use ACE inhibition or angiotensin receptor blocker alone or in combination with another class. So that's a compelling indication for ACE inhibition. Right? So in the black population, you want to start thiazide or calcium channel blocker alone or in combination. And if non-black, you can choose either thiazide, ACE inhibition, ARB, calcium channel blocker alone or in combination. Then you follow up the patient and ask, is your blood pressure at goal? If the answer is no, you reinforce lifestyle and adherence and titrate medication to maximum dose or consider strategy B with another medication before you max out one, right? Then you ask yourself, is the blood pressure at goal again? If the answer is no, once again, reinforce lifestyle and adherence. So there's power and repetition, right? Uh, or you can add a medication class not selected before, like a beta blocker, aldo antagonist, and others, and titrate medications. It's, and you follow up the patient, and if on the third visit, they're still not at goal, then you want to titrate meds to maximum doses and or refer to a hypertension specialist, right? That was your JNC8 in a nutshell. Okay, everybody, let's now look at prognosis and complications. Antihypertensive therapy is associated with a substantial reduction. Look at this, 20 to 25% reduction in uh, incidence of MI, which is good. 50% reduction in incidence of heart failure, brilliant. And 35 to 40% reduction in incidence of stroke, very important. We know the association between hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy. This is common and is associated with increased mortality and mobility because of the increased incidence of congestive biventricular failure myocardial infarct, arrhythmias, and sudden cardiac death. Hypertension, as we know, is among the most common uh, risk factors for stroke, cerebral hemorrhage, and chronic kidney disease. After commencing therapy, patients should be followed up at least initially on a monthly basis to encourage lifestyle changes and ensure optimal medication doses. And once the blood pressure goal is maintained, follow-up can then be uh, three to six monthly. <coughs> You're very important. You want to monitor your sodium, potassium, and creatinine for at least once or twice per year. Okay, guys, coming back to our uh, uh, clinical question that we posed earlier. Uh, we said that a large proportion of blood pressure is determined by peripheral vascular resistance. We said that blood pressure is the result of the product of cardiac output and total peripheral resistance, and cardiac output was the product of heart rate and stroke volume. But regarding peripheral vascular resistance, which is a major anatomical vascular structure, dum -dum 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 -dum. Arterioles, small arteries and arterioles, right? Uh, so there's our beloved equation uh, here, which we've discussed before. So cardiac output and peripheral resistance are the two determinants of arterial pressure, and cardiac output is determined by stroke volume and heart rate. Now, stroke volume is related to myocardial contractility, oomph, the oomph of contraction, and the size of the vascular compartment. But peripheral resistance is determined by and large by functional and anatomical changes in the small arteries and arterioles, the very small resistance vessels. Okay, my friends, today we're going to talk about what scripture from the Bible tells us about the problem of lust. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. 
The problem of lust is a very prevalent problem in today's society, and it is no respecter of age, both young and old alike, especially when we see what is portrayed uh, through the media. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes. You've got to really use self-discipline to control your eyes. The Lord Jesus Christ says that the eyes are the lamp of the body. If a man's eyes are full of light, then his body will be full of light. But if his eyes are full of darkness, how great indeed is that darkness, right? So I pray that we will be able to flee from lust. We shouldn't fight lust. We should run in the opposite direction so that we can keep ourselves pure until the return of Christ. God bless you. And these are my references. You can catch me on Facebook. My page is entitled Internal Medicine Algorithms and Mnemonics. I'm also on Instagram and on TikTok. Looking forward to your friendship on those platforms. God bless you. We're going to be tackling the topic, an age-old topic in internal medicine in the next video. Syphilis. God bless you.